the process of totally getting rid of a group of people involves dehumanizing them in a number of different ways, right? Like we've talked on this channel about the 10 stages of genocide by the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust. They've published this um, information from Gregory Stanton's research. And part of it is the dehumanization and rhetoric about the group. It's a way of manufacturing consent is I think the term where the news talks about, oh, these trans people are harming kids and oh, this drag queen story hour. Oh, isn't it so weird that these people are trying to do this around kids? And so they're creating a narrative in which trans people are harming kids, which means that they're basically engendering in most people who read that, they're thinking, I can't believe trans people are groomers or trans people are trying to harm kids in some way, which then, you know, obviously we know that there is this sort of, it's acceptable to be violent toward people who've harmed children. I think there's a vibe in our culture where we kind of feel that way, broadly speaking. So if you try to say, oh, you know, trans people are harming kids, then you engender like violent sentiment toward us. It's a pretty straightforward process and it's been going on for a while. And critical, critical in that is that media aspect where the news and magazines and public officials, like all as part of the media, create a narrative that causes, you know, regular people to A, be okay with the government increasing restrictions and violence toward the affected group, and uh, B, might cause individual people to choose to be violent or join militias in order to enact sort of militia level violence against people in their communities who they believe to be harmful, you know? If you're enjoying this video, hit the like button, maybe subscribe, hit all notifications if you want. Feel free to check out the links in the description. You might find some merch you like, or you can hit up the Patreon to support the content and find free stuff. I bring this up because the New York Times, I've noticed, they've been covering these anti-trans bills and they've been talking about trans youth and posting various stuff about trans people. And I've noticed that a lot of them are not very favorable to trans people. And, you know, I'm kind of turned off from reading anything from the New York Times because it just feels unbalanced and kind of unnecessarily hostile. And it turns out that that's not just my personal feeling. It is actually borne out in a study which found that New York Times has failed to quote trans people in 66%, the majority of stories about anti-trans bills. So apparently there's like a pretty major problem with anti-trans bias in, in ways that are kind of neglecting some journalism 101 suggestions, I guess. So there were like 65 articles that mentioned anti-trans legislation in their headline or lead paragraphs. And so GLAAD, uh, I can't remember what GLAAD stands for. It's a one of those queer um, media organizations asked the Times to address this anti-trans bias, like by setting up meetings with members of the trans community or hiring trans writers and editors at the paper. They haven't done any of those things. So we've discovered that 66% of the articles did not quote even one trans or gender non-conforming person. 18% of the articles quoted straight up misinformation from anti-trans activists without adequate fact checking or additional context. Six articles obscured the anti-trans background of their sources, erasing histories of extremist rhetoric or actions. So they were using sources in their articles who are anti-trans and they were obscuring the fact that those people had an anti-trans bias in their reporting. Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. Thank you for that. It had been such a long time since I thought about that. This specific type of thing is also very common for anti-trans reporting and news in the Netherlands. It is, it's very frustrating. So one of the recommendations that GLAAD has given, you know, is please just interview the people who are impacted by your coverage and include their perspectives. That is like reporting 101. And the New York Times has not only not done that, but they've replaced it with a pattern of obfuscating sources anti-trans affiliations and allowing that misinformation to go unchecked. This coalition calls on them to improve their coverage of trans people. I kind of feel like 
I don't think it's an unfair comparison. I don't think it's an unfair comparison to say that the New York Times is kind of the modern Der Stormer. Because Der Stormer was not government-owned media. Der Stormer was privately owned, and it was a propaganda newspaper where they hosted articles talking about how terrible Jewish people were and like increasingly posting about how Jewish people deserved to be harmed, essentially. Like it's a critical component of a genocide to have the news media helping you by dr drumming up unnecessarily unnecessary violence, like violent rhetoric against the affected group. We had a local newspaper that had one line about an assault that happened at our pride parade two years ago. And a week later, there was a one page interview with a transphobic detransitioner. Yeah, it's so fair and balanced. You know, we might ask, like, how can you possibly run a story about trans people without talking to the people who are going to be directly affected by the policy? The only reason you would exclude these voices is if the goal is not actually to report the news, but to advance the anti-trans cause. Because if you wanted to report the news, like Mama was just saying in the chat, you would have to basically bring on like 80%, maybe 90% pro-trans people and like occasionally an anti-trans person. And that would be actually reflective of what's going on in our world. The Intercept did a piece about the New York Times re a terrible reporting in the story about the supposed uh, systemic sexual assault by Hamas on October 7. In it, one of their employees described how the New York Times higher-ups were clearly only asking her to backfill the predetermined story they wanted to run. It's like, you you might as well just run ChatGPT on this one for as much as, for as much, like, actual writing they wanted to have done. Much love to my patrons, especially Tiago Nascimento, Mersh Rolvog, Michelle Frateroli, Amanda B., Wellington Marcus, Michelle Winter, Danielle McDonald, DZXN, Suzanne Maynard, Spooky Heather Sylvia, Jamie Jam, Pastnell Infinity, Nova, Sojo, Elizabeth Bartell, Ella V. Nobody, Kevin Young, Sarah A., Athiet, Celeste, Desi Quiche, Liam Hodgson, and Mr. Atheist.